Assembly, Committee Room 30. Okay, um, members, you're very welcome to the meeting. We'll make a start then. Um, first of all, I'd like to update members that um, for circumstances just that Mike Nesbitt has resigned as the Deputy Chair of the Committee um, as of Tuesday the 4th of May, and he has been replaced on the Committee uh, to be the Deputy Chairperson is Doug Beatty. So, Doug, we welcome you to your uh, first meeting with ourselves. Colin, thank uh, you. It's hopefully, uh, it'll be uh, something that you can catch up with uh, quickly and hit the ground running with things. So, yeah, you're, like you're very welcome. First um, day at school. Um, uh, that's it, it, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll get caught up. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> realising that you weren't on the committee. <laughs> because I was justice. on justice. justice. Uh, that's what and that's what you said, justice. <laughs> um, I suppose the only um, small bit of housekeeping, um, Doug, just to update you on, is that generally whenever we do um, questions after presentations, I, I normally make a start, but I normally would pass to the deputy chair to go second. So okay. just if you're ready yourself that in, at any point that we have witnesses that normally it's the, the deputy chair that will go second for those questions. So uh, we have, uh, as I say, Trevor, Martina and the three guys from the victims service. So uh, there's another person I think has joined us there, is there? George Robinson. Oh, George. Hello, George. You're very welcome. I hope you're keeping well. Keeping grand. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we've just uh -huh. started, George. So you're just in time. We're just getting through the initial parts of the meeting. That's, so, that's great. That's great. Thank you very much. So then, in that case, just for um, the record at this stage, then um, the members present in the room is Pat and Trevor Lum, Doug Beatty, and Christopher Stalford, and myself. And online we have Martina, uh, Trevor Clark, and George Robinson. And I'll introduce the guys from the Victim and Survivor Service in a minute when we get to that part. So. Um, just to remind everybody that the committee proceedings are recorded and broadcast online and in Parliament buildings mm. and that if you've got mobile devices that they're on silent and not interfering with any of the uh, audiovisual equipment. We have no apologies. I think we're, two, three, we're all present anyway. Are we just one, just one missing? Um, but no apologies at this stage. Draft minutes uh, are available on page five of the meeting pack. Are members content that it's a true and accurate record of the meeting from last week? Yeah. 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 Okay, and that basis then we will sign those. Okay. Matters arising then. Just following uh, last week's evidence session on Brexit issues, the committee requested a copy of the brief provided to the ministers in advance of the first specialised committee meeting, which took place on the 30th of April. The committee had asked for the information for consideration at this week's meeting, uh, but we haven't received a copy of that as yet. However, we have received, and we'll make reference later, uh, to the fact that the junior ministers are coming to the committee next week to discuss um, their attendance at that meeting. But, as I say, we were hoping that we could have got the, the brief for this week to discuss to prepare us for questions for next week, but hopefully we will receive that in advance of their attendance at the committee next week. Um, any other matters arising? Then, in that case, we can move on then to item four. Item four is an overview briefing from the Victims and Survivors Service. Uh, members, on page 11 of the meeting pack is an overview briefing paper from the Victim Survivor Service. Um, the service has also provided information on its response to support victims and survivors through the COVID-19 crisis, and that can be found on page 22 of the meeting pack. Um, we have, via teleconference today, we have three representatives from the service. We have Margaret Bateson, who is the Chief Executive Officer, Oliver Wilkinson, who is the Chair of the Victim and Survivor Service Board, and Andrew Walker, who is the Head of Operations for the Victim and Survivor Service. I will pass over now to those um, to people to give us their update and just to advise uh, the three witnesses that the session is being recorded by Hansard and the script will be published on the committee web page. So if we pass over to yourselves, maybe Margaret, is it yourself that's going to take the lead? No, I, I'll do a, an introduction and then we'll take questions from you if that's, if that's okay with 
uh, you, Chair and Committee members. Certainly. Just uh, if Ms. you give Oliver me. Wilkinson. I was just going to say, if you can give us who the I is, so it's yourself, Oliver, then, if you, you want to make yes. a start, and we'll come in at the end, then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to brief you today on the work of the Victim and Survivor Service. Um, as I say, my name is Oliver Wilkinson, and Margaret uh, Bitzner, Chief Executive, and Andrew Walker, Head of Operations, are uh, with me on all our lines. Um, for information, Margaret and I last briefed the committee in November 16. We are therefore conscious that some of the membership of this committee has changed since our last briefing, and therefore both my opening remarks and the briefing papers aim to also provide an introduction for new members to the work of the Victim and Survivor Service. <clears throat> the briefing paper provided within your pack outlines the approach we take to supporting victims and survivors through a number of programs with a common theme of being victim-led and flexible to align with our vision, which is to improve the health and well-being of victims and survivors. Before taking questions, I'd like to provide you with a brief summary of the current service delivery model, the programs delivered by us to support victims and survivors, and also to highlight some of the key current strategic issues which we face. So in April 17, the Victim and Survivor Service introduced a new model of service delivery aimed at connecting individual victims and survivors to services and support based on their individual needs. These were across three strands. The first of those strands is the health and well-being casework. In implementation of this new model, over 5,900 victims and survivors have accessed health and well-being support through a caseworker. We carefully monitor the quality of the services we provide. We know, for example, that on average 60% of the individuals completing a talking therapy plan report reliable clinical improvement. And 80% of individuals completing a plan for complementary therapy report a reliable improvement in well-being. And similarly, 67% of individuals in receipt of other needs-based support, such as disability aids, persistent pain, education and training report a, an improvement in day-to-day -day functioning. The second strand is advocacy support in the area of truth, justice and acknowledgement. This involves one-to-one -one advocacy support to engage with institutions such as PSNI Legacy Branch, Legacy Inquest, Prony, Pony and other institutions in Ireland GB and beyond, and over 2,300 victims and survivors have accessed advocacy support to date. The third strand is community-led provision of support and services. This new service delivery model complements a broad range of services at community level through our 54 funded organizations, including psychological therapies, social support, welfare, storytelling, complementary therapies, and personal development, and over 14,000 victims and survivors per annum access these services. The services that Victim and Survivor Service and the community and voluntary sector provide are what are described in, your inform in the more detailed information pack you have as step one to step three interventions according to the stepped care model for mental health provision. Monitoring and evaluation. Strengthened monitoring and evaluation also means that we can better identify and address gaps in services. For those victims and survivors for whom support and services have not reported an improvement, work is ongoing to explore possible reasons for that. 
The committee, I'm sure, will appreciate this is a complex and sensitive area of work, and we continually learn, improve, and refine what we do. <clears throat> I'd like to now draw your attention to two other gaps in service delivery. The first relates to service provision to the bereaved. We have learnt that much of the health and well-being casework support and working is working very well for the physically and psychologically injured. For example, disability aid, physiotherapy, psychological therapy, education and training. And for the most seriously injured, the victim's payment scheme will also soon be available. However, many of the bereaved are elderly, and they are telling us that this support is often unsuitable for them. This leaves very limited options for support for the bereaved who have come forward after the 31st of March 2017. That was the point at which self-directed assistant payments were stopped in order to move to the new model that I mentioned earlier. We are acutely aware of this gap in provision and have recommended that the cutoff date of the 31st of March 17 is removed to allow recognition of the bereaved to be continued in the form of a self-directed assistance payment. TU officials have identified this as a matter requiring a ministerial decision and we continue to engage with TEO and the Commission for Victims and Survivors to identify options to be considered for submission to ministers. The second relates to the establishment of the Regional Trauma Service, our Regional Trauma Network. We have highlighted a number of issues in our briefing paper to you raised by the victim sector, and we remain committed to finding solutions to these with our colleagues in health. The sector is not asking for the regional trauma network, for a regional trauma network, which is exclusive for victims and survivors, but for a pathway which protects and prioritizes both referrals and interventions needed for the small number of victims and survivors requiring mental health interventions, described as step four and step five interventions. And you'll see that in the, the more detailed pack of information covering issues of clinical psychology and psychiatry. What we're talking about is in line with the intentions of the Stormont House Agreement and the expectations set over the past number of years within the sector. Other strategic matters I want to touch on then. We have also outlined a number of strategic matters which currently impact on the work we do, which we're happy to discuss further. These include the Victims' Payment Scheme, formerly known as the Victims' Pension, welfare reform, and potential new legacy mechanisms as outlined in the New Decade New Approach document. I want to finish finally on our contingency planning in relation to coronavirus. We have been carefully monitoring all current advice and guidance and taking proactive steps to protect the health and well-being of both staff, our community partners, and victims and survivors. We have provided members with the actions we have taken as a supplementary sheet uh, to the papers you have today. This includes a redesign of all support and services and a move to online or remote, where possible, um, service. For example, online education and training and telephone counselling. We've issued more than 5,700 self-directed assistance payments on the 1st of April 2020, which was six weeks in advance of when those payments are normally made each year. We have made over 1,000 food and essential parcel uh, deliveries. We have offered a two-year extension to letters of offer to our community and voluntary partners and advanced over 700 home heating payments. And additionally, budget we have encouraged <coughs> budget flexibility to allow our community partners to be proactive 
and meeting emergent and urgent needs, including food and other essentials. Now, finally, I'd like to thank all of the VSS staff and our community partners for working so quickly to get so much needed support and assurance on the ground quickly. The board and the senior management look forward to working with you as a committee, with our colleagues across the sector, in the Commission for Victims and Survivors, the department and elsewhere to meet these challenges. Our focus remains very firmly on the delivery of victim-centered services and support, which improve the lives of victims and survivors. We would now welcome your comments. Okay, um, Oliver, thank you very much indeed for that uh, presentation. Uh, it's been, and it will be good for a number of the members that are new to the committee, myself included, just to get a flavour uh, of some of the work that's taken place. So we appreciate your time uh, in coming here today and giving us that presentation. Um, maybe if I could begin with just two or three questions and maybe ask that as one of the key areas of work that you have um, is about the health and well-being um, of, of those that you work with, can I just ask about, do you have any specific ways that you measure that? Um, I mean, do you do benchmarking of people when they start to engage with you and then you track that? Or is it something that's, you know, what sort of, how is that measurement completed? Yep, it's Margaret. I'll take that question. Um, since 2014, we have implemented an outcomes focus to monitor and evaluation, which really looks at each service individually. And then we have developed with victims and survivors and the community and voluntary sector um, appropriate monitor and evaluation for each of those services. So we don't have a one size fits all monitor and evaluation framework. Um, but if I took a few examples um, in terms of complementary therapies, the outcome that we use um, for it is called MIMOP, um, which is measure your own medical outcomes. And what MIMOP does is ask uh, victims and survivors to choose one or two symptoms, physical or mental, which are bothering them the most. So the two most difficult things that they might be having trouble with. So that can be things like anxiety, back pain, headaches, stress. And then we ask, now choose one activity, either physical, social, or mental, that's important to you, and what would you like to achieve from um, the complementary therapy? And that could be something like walking, running, housework, being able to play with their grandchildren. And we then ask at the start of the therapy a number of questions in those areas, and then during therapy, and then at the end of therapy. So that's how we know that 80% of people report a reliable um, clinical improvement in that area. Um, in terms of the counselling services, the outcome uh, measurement tool that we use is called Cornet. Um, and it's quite a similar process where a range of questions are asked um, in, rela in relation to a range of areas. And then we also monitor that during therapy and after therapy. And it's very much a collaborative approach between the therapist and the individual where those outcomes and measurements are shown during um, and after the therapy. And it can um, almost improve the therapeutic process because individuals can see where they're improving and maybe where they're not. And, and again, that's how we know for complementary or for uh, counselling that 60% um, are showing a clinical reliable improvement. And if you benchmark that to the likes of the UK-wide IAPT programme, that's roughly in line with the same sort of outcome um, that they would see. But obviously in counselling, you're looking in a bit more depth at mental health issues in terms of trouble with aches and pains, in terms of self-harm to self, um, or harm to others, um, disturbed by unwanted thoughts and feelings, um, and suicidal ideation. So it, it, that's why we use a different tool um, to complementary therapies, because it just depends on the support and service, what is most appropriate. And then for most of our other health and wellbeing services, we would use what's called the Work and Social Adjustment Scale. And it looks at five areas. It looks at um, the person's ability to work, the person's ability to manage the home, um, social leisure activities, private leisure activities, 
and the ability to form and maintain close relationships. So for things like the education and training, the disability aid, um, and the other health and wellbeing support that we offer, that would be the, the tool that we, we use for that. Um, and I would just finish in saying that it's important not only in terms of the outcome for the individual um, and to make sure that the individual is aware that that's happening, but that it's not intrusive and that it's a useful tool. Um, so we're very clear that we don't do monitoring evaluation for the purposes of collecting data that we don't need. We really use this to drive and change and improve the support and services um, that we deliver. And it's how we're much, uh, it's much easier now than three, four years ago to identify gaps in our services and then want to do something to fill those gaps. answer and appreciate that. Um, maybe just to ask then, is, is your funding dependent on, on any targets surrounding achievements within those um, scores? I mean, uh, do you declare that you want to try and achieve X amount of people progressing or, or is it just really that it's the health and well-being and it's up to yourselves to break that down and set targets or, or monitor that just? So our funding from both the executive office and um, SUPB for our PEACH 4 funding um, is set on what I would call um, traditional beneficiary and output targets. So throughput, the number of individuals in receipt of complementary therapy, the number of individuals in receipt of counselling, um, the number of <coughs> individuals um, engaged in um, trauma-focused physical activity, for example. So it's... Um, I'm trying to find the, the term, it, it, it's numerical, yeah. um, that added value and that richness um, in terms of looking at the outcomes and looking at the quality of the service is something that we've implemented ourselves and we're not, uh, our funding doesn't depend on it. Okay. And then, um, I see from the um, shape that we have in your presentation document that there's around about nearly 7.9 million that you fund to part community partners and uh, other groups. Can you give us a flavour of what type of groups those are, what type of work they do, and how, how that fr that funding is framed? Yep. Um, in to, in November two thousand and sixteen, we opened um, a call to all community and voluntary organisations um, in relation to doing things better and a new service delivery model. So at that point of time. Um, what we said in terms of funding criteria was that everyone needed to be engaged and embrace the vision and the mission of the Victims and Survivors Service, that we were all working towards a common goal of improving the health and well-being of victims and survivors. And as a result of that, we currently 51 funded community and or voluntary organisations across Northern Ireland. If you look at the types of organisations that are funded, there are five large organisations, the We of Trauma Centre, well, Realms for Justice, South East Fermanagh Foundation, the Ely Centre and the Ashton Centre, who would be responsible for roughly 50% of the budget and 50% of the service delivery. And then the other organisations would make up the balance. And of those other organisations, 11 of them are what we would say are small social support organisations. So you have a broad range of community and voluntary organisations because victims and survivors have a broad range of needs. And the types of services that they would um, be delivering would include um, over 2,000 individuals accessing um, talking therapy, psychological therapy, over 2,000 individuals accessing complementary therapy, um, over, over 10,000 individuals um, access and social support, um, just over 1,500 um, access and welfare support in terms of welfare reform um, and any welfare needs, over um, 2,300 access and advocacy support in the area of truth, justice, acknowledgement, and then there's a range of other smaller programs, um, personal professional development and respite breaks and so on. So a broad range to try and meet the broad range of needs that are out there. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that. So I'm going to pass over now to the Deputy Chair, to um, Doug Beatty. Hi, uh, Margaret Oliver and Andrew. Um, this is my first day in the committee, so 
Um, I'm very, very new, but I'd just like to start by thanking you for the work uh, that you do, and please pass it on to all of your staff uh, who do an exceptional job, and, and particularly uh, at this really trying time that we're going through uh, at the minute. It's incredibly important, so thank you very much um, for what you do. Um, could I just ask a couple of questions, just to try and get a slightly better understanding, um, uh, and then see where some of the frictions are? But if I just look at um, those people who are getting funded help from yourselves, um, it, it's looking like just over about 22,000. Um, that's either community services or direct services or self-directed payments. But how many of those individuals, when I count them up of the 22,000, uh, are, are allocated to both? So is there any of those who are getting self-directed payments who are also getting services through the community service orga and funded organisations? Yes, um, and the difficulty um, in giving you an accurate figure to that really relates to GDPR, where we have um, our own um, database in the BSS, where those who are in receipt of self-directed assistance payments obviously give us explicit consent to, to keep all their data and information. And then out in the community and foundry organisations, um, they have all their own monitoring evaluation systems and they all come through to us with unique identifiers on it. But we do know, because we've tried to find that out over the years, that around 50% of the individuals who are in receipt of a self-directed assistance payment also um, get health and wellbeing services from um, community and voluntary organisations. And that's something that at the end of the Peace 4 programme we'll be able to report much more accurately because we're now not only um, not only do we know those who have had um, directed assistance payments, but we're starting to see through the Health and Wellbeing Caseworker Network all the individual needs consultations that are being carried out. I know everyone who's been um, signposted and referred to other health and wellbeing supporting services and that's all in the same system so certainly I would say in two years time we'll be able to give a much more accurate figure. Okay uh, and fair enough uh, Morgan. I mean I guess what I was really trying to do was just find out uh, what is the scale of those who you are helping you know 22,000, 15,000, um, 30,000 <clears> is that held anywhere just I mean it's just a general thing that I was sort of trying to get a get a, get a gist of. It's not because they're on three different uh, managed information systems held by different organisations. No, that's fine. I, I, there's no issue. But but I would I our our feeling is um, based on fifty percent of um, individuals who come directly to BSS also go into organisations. Yeah. That in terms of unique individuals, there's probably in the region of sixteen thousand, sixteen to eighteen thousand unique individuals. And, 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 that's a, and that's a hefty workload. Um, can, can I just take you to the victim payment scheme, which I know it's not yours, it's, it's the NIOs, and they've handed on to um, the executive office to get somebody to administrate it, but you are in a very u unique position. Have you received any update whatsoever on which organisation is going to be administrating the victim's payment scheme? Uh, and if you haven't, are you concerned, um, given that this is due to go live at the end of the month? We are not aware which organisation or government department will be the administrator of the fixed and payment scheme, and we haven't received any communication um, in relation to who is administering it. There is a practical implementation group, and while you're correct in saying um, it's not the role of responsibility, responsibility of CSS, we would be really keen to be involved in the design of practical things like applications and assessments, just because we think We've a lot. We've learnt a lot. You know, we've a lot of lessons to share, things not to do, and things to do. Um, so there is a practical implementation group, and I know that's meeting again on the twentieth of May. Um, and in terms of whether we're concerned or not, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's a and that's a fair one. But but uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you're absolutely in a unique position. And I'm just looking at um, your, your your written brief, um, and in the first year. You, you're anticipating that you may need another 700,000 just yourselves for uh, the sort of the, the, the issues that, that come about by those people who are going through this process. Um, and, I, and I guess that's not been identified, that money has not been identified either? Uh, not yet. And I suppose that is for two things. One is the practical support to help people from an advocacy perspective to complete applications and go through the process. And then the second is. 
um, we would anticipate as people go through that process, it might be difficult and they might, um, you know, in terms of retrieving information and thinking about things that they maybe haven't thought about for a long time. So we're aware that that may then um, uh, necessitate an increase in our health and wellbeing services as well. Okay, um, thank you. I mean, that's really clear. Um, and, and I am concerned that, that they haven't nominated somebody um, uh, to be the administrator for this, given that it's, it's three weeks away and it, and it goes live. And uh, my inbox as an MLA is increasing uh, day to day by people asking for information. But um, I, I, I think you've been very clear in, in what you've said. Can I just then move on to one of the gaps that you mentioned? And I've only just picked this up, up on this one. Um, uh, and again, to, to any of you, but you, we talk about the gap in regards to the bereaved and you're trying to get rid of the, um, the, the March 2017 um, time frame for um, people who are bereaved um, for self directed assessment payments. C could you just cl quickly clarify for me, please, um, who that bereaved would be? Are we talking about a direct bereavement? Or are we talking about a family member? Or are we talking about somebody in a, in, a, in a hierarchy who could be classed as being bereaved? Because we know that bereavement does um, get passed down the line through families. We do, and I think um, in, an, in an ideal world, if we, if we had um, an insurmountable amount of budget, we would obviously want to provide support um, to all of the bereaved. But within this context, the self-directed assistance payments, the eligibility um, is limited to those who are bereaved by parents, spouse, partner, or child. Okay, um, th thank you. I think that was probably for my own knowledge, and, and most of the others probably probably knew that. And, and I just want to acknowledge the regional uh, trauma network issues, um, uh, and you have my support on, on where you stand in regards to that. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Trevor Lunn. Okay, hello, Bargett, Andrew, Oliver. Uh, Hi, Trevor. I'm I'm on the uh, victims payment scheme as well. But after, after the answers you've given, Doug, I have a feeling you may not be able to answer my <laughs> questions. <laughs> but not to worry. I'm, I'm curious about the, the level of evidence that might be required, for, particularly for injuries that may have happened almost 50 years ago now. And, and people, perhaps, who you never, in those days never thought about making a compensation claim uh, may not have attended their doctor even until some years later, and perhaps their... Disability could be progressive. It could be deterioration over the years. I mean, can you give us any flavour of what uh, what level of eligibility and evidence may be required? I, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that question. Just in terms of um, those who are disabilities, um, BSS is the service delivery body for health and wellbeing services. Um, we wouldn't have a role in terms of setting the eligibility, the criteria, or the level of evidence um, for any victim's uh, payment scheme. That would need to be done by uh, the administrator of the scheme when they were appointed. Yeah. So I, I don't want to surmise, because it, I'm not sure that would be helpful for victims either. No, I wouldn't want you to do that, but there, there was a level of discussion about this uh, prior to the Assembly closing down. and. Uh, the feeling that we got at that time was that I wouldn't say it would be a relaxed regime, but it would be not not too onerous, and that they perhaps the the requirement of proof would be not as severe as it might be, say, for a compensation claim in the old days. Um, Certainly, for victims and survivors who are registered with the Victims and Survivors Service, um, we would be proposing a similar. Um, exercise to what we did with the Department for Communities for under welfare reform, um, where we got consent from each of the individual victims and survivors, and we shared the information um, for them um, through the Department for Communities to try and avoid a face-to-face -face reassessment um, during the transition from DLA to PIP. Um, and certainly there'll be a proposal to try and do the same thing again to try and take that burden away from victims and towards the BSS and our community and voluntary partners. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks, that, is, that is all part of our interest in ensuring that whatever systems are established are victim-centred. Uh, we do not want individuals to have to go and retell a story which another organization like us already knows 
uh, and we want the information to be accepted. We want to be involved in providing information uh, insofar as we're able to do so in order to minimize the stress or distress that might be caused to any individual who applies to the victim uh, payment scheme. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I'm thinking of people who have never accessed the system. This will be their first time because this, this scheme has been publicized. I mean, and, and that's, what, that's going to be a significant um, challenge, and that's why we're really keen that there's um, sufficient advocacy support in place to help people retrieve as much information um, as possible. And you, you would hope to provide that adequacy? We would. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, Pat. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, and thank you, Margaret, uh, Oliver, and Andrew. Uh, and just want to acknowledge, Oliver, that uh, you're staying on as Chair for uh, another while anyway. So, thank you uh, for that, Pat. I don't know whether it's congratulations or commiserations, <laughs> but uh, in any event, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll give the usual leadership that you always do. Um, so, so Kenneth Bloomfield referred to this area of work as a painful privilege. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, that was that was a, a very apt uh, phrase to have coined. Um, so you'll be relieved. I don't want to ask you about the the the, the uh, victims payment scheme. Uh, I, I just want to ask about your own work, and you probably covered a lot of it, Oliver, in your own comprehensive presentation there earlier. But just in terms of the the groups that are supported by VSS, they're they're going to be supported for the next two years. Um, how did that process come about? Um, did, did you work well with the department, and what level of investment is involved? Margaret, would you get the detail of that? Yeah. Um, in terms of whether, I suppose a decision had to be made, um, whether at the end of this three-year funding period, which would have been March 2020, um, did we go out to an open call, or did we extend the contract? Um, for a further number of years, and what number of years would that be? And the two-year extension came as a result of considering a number of factors. The first um, was that the victim's um, strategy stopped in November 2019, so that we needed a new strategy, and we needed time for that um, engagement and co-design process to take place. Um, led by the Commission for Victims and Survivors. And then the second um, consideration was more practical consideration, and that was that the PACE 4 program and our core funding are um, linked. You can't decouple them. Um, one goes with the other. Um, and the PACE 4 funding um, stops in March 2022. So it made sense to align both the funding periods to give stability to the sector and allow us to continue with what we've been doing under Peace 4 in terms of improving the services. There is a programme up in the Executive Office called a, a, a co-design programme, um, and that's where BSF, the Executive Office and the Commission um, meet on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, and the, the discussions around that extension would have, would have been part of that. Okay, and I suppose uh, there are going to be challenges uh, moving forward. What, what do you see those challenges as being? And I suppose we often ask about uh, challenges. What, what are the deliverables? What, what are the, the, the issues that you see VSS having a big input in, into? I think there's a number of strategic challenges. Um, starting with the ones that we outlined um, in the briefing paper in terms of over the next number of years. Um, I almost don't want to mention it again, but the Victims Payment Scheme, but we, we will have a role in terms of the advocacy support in that over the next number of years. Um, the Regional Trauma Network and trying to really get that lifted up off the ground um, so that there is a 
protect it and prioritise referral pathways for victims, no matter what type of service and intervention they need, and no matter who's providing that, whether it's VSAS or community partners or statutory services. And um, at a practical level, um, the challenges are that it has taken people um, time to trust um, the VSS, um, and it's taken time for people to come forward for help and support. Um, and I can see with the Regional Trauma Network and the Victims Payment that um, the demand for our health and wellbeing services could grow, um, and it's just really being able to keep up with that demand and keep providing the, the support and services that we're doing and to the, to the standards that we're doing. I think what one of the other things, uh, if I could add, Pat, is that um, the level of professionalism now within the community and voluntary sector is extremely high and certainly on a par with anything that you'll see out there in the statutory sector. Um, it will be a job for us to keep up with the growing professionalism of the work that is being done out there in the community se and voluntary sector, listening to them, hearing what uh, they are saying, the challenges that are coming from that, and responding appropriately to it. Um, I, I'm very, I was very pleased that the Chair's first question was on uh, monitoring and evaluating the quality of the work that we're doing. When previously um, we were simply concerned about reaching out to more and more people, uh, today we are certainly concerned to reach out to more people, but we're also very concerned to ensure that the standards of service that we are providing are standards of excellence that are not only be applicable here, but uh, internationally, because I think there's a great deal to learn from the type of work that is taking place within the victim and, and survivor community that uh, is applicable in many other areas of conflict in the world. Just one final question, Chair, if you don't mind. Just uh, going back on to the, the regional trauma network, and Margaret, you a couple of times uh, in, in your answers have used the term co-design. I'm just wondering, has the VSS had any input in the co-design or co-production of uh, the, the regional trauma network model that's being discussed? Um, the regional trauma network um, model that, that's currently um, on the table, we have raised a number of issues um, on behalf of the sector in relation to it. Um, some of those issues um, have been resolved um, and two, I would say, have not. So in, in terms of where we've had some sort of resolution, there has been much better engagement with the community and voluntary sector in terms of assessment referral process and making sure that those um, processes take place where victims and survivors feel most comfortable. So previously, where there was a thought that it might need to take place in a trust building, for example, it could take place out in the community and voluntary sector or within VSS. Um, but there are two issues that are, that are still outstanding. Um, one is around lack of co-design and lack of co-production. Um, and the approach that's been undertaken to date, I would say, is probably not in line with how we would have co-designed the support and services with the sector in 2016 when we're coming up with a new service delivery model, which was you know, very much speaking to as many victims and survivors and community and voluntary partners as, as, we, as we could. Um, so that is an issue. Um, there was a hope that there would be um, specific co-design sessions with all stakeholders, so the Department of Health, Health and Social Care Board, Community of Boundary Partners and BSS in February 2020, um, and that unfortunately um, was postponed. Um, but I suppose I'm acutely aware of the pressures that our colleagues in health are currently under, um, and we hope that um, when those pressures may ease, that this will be a priority for the coming months. Yeah, thanks for that. Because you know, in, in the discussions around transformation of the health service, uh, co-production and co-design were at the very forefront in, in any discussions that were taking place. 
And it's of the essence that if we're going to change things and if we're going to create new models within the, within the health service, that those who are affected should have uh, you know, a significant input in the design of the models. So uh, that, that's just a comment, it's not a question. Uh, uh, and thanks very much for your input today. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to just do something that now to move to those members that are on the uh, phones. I'm just going to ask them in turn in the order that they um, arrived into the call. So can I check, Martina, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Um, can, I, can I first uh, thank um, Oliver and Margaret and Andrew for, for their presentation and, and for the information they have received and welcome Doug onto the committee. This is uh, a unique way to engage uh, given it's your first committee meeting. Um, can I, you know, I think reiterate uh, what has been said here with regards to the quality of the work being done. I think as you've outlined uh, the benefits, um, that is quite clear, the practical benefits, uh, even the support uh, in the way and the quality and the level of percentage um, satisfaction uh, and improvement that you outlined that, that's heartening. Uh, maybe two questions, if you don't mind, Chair. One is to ask, uh, so that I'm clear that the, that the CSS groups are now supported for two years. And if that be in the case, to ask just how did that process work with departments uh, and what's the level of investment? And then my second question would relate to the level of CSS engagement and input into the Peace Plus consultation and to ask um, if, if there's satisfaction and confidence that the needs of victims and survivors will be accommodated within the new programme and how the CSS uh, as a body is feeding, and feeding into that process. Okay. Okay, okay in terms of the um, two-year extension to contract, yes, that took place. So um, contracts have been extended up until March 2022 in terms of um, core funding and we have approval to from SUBB to extend contracts on the ground until December 2021 at the minute but we expect to extend that by a further three months so that both the core funding by the executive office and the peace core funding are tightly aligned because one one goes with the other um, in terms of the level of investment, it's six point six million pounds per year to um, fifty one organisations here, um, and one organisation in GB, the um, Peace Foundation in Warrington, which is solely funded out of Peace Four, um, not mm -hmm. through any core funding. Um, and in terms of how the uh, process worked. Um, there was a series of sessions with the Victims Practitioners Working Group. So we have two working groups, um, two geographical working groups, um, and they meet every quarter or so. And that's where the victims groups come together with the VSS and CVS in attendance and the Executive Office in attendance, and where we talked through um, the practicalities of, of what needed to be done um, for that two-year extension. Does that answer that question? It does, it does, thank you. Yep. And then in terms of um, Peace Plus, um, the time frames are um, pretty tight on, on that at the mm -hmm. minute, um, because what we want to ensure is that there's no gap funding issues between um, Peace 4 ending and Peace Plus starting, because we would still want to ensure that the caseworker network and the advocacy support network is there on the ground and that in the main is what Peace 4 funds. So we have um, just started that engagement. There's been one meeting um, in the last sort of seven to ten days between CSS, the Commission and the Executive Office. And then this week and next week, um, starting yesterday, um, I am engaging one to one with each of the Peace 4 funded organisations and really um, outlining the four areas that Peace 4 funds, health and wellbeing, advocacy support, resilience, and uh, training and development, and asking you know, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, what are the other gaps 
um, that should be addressed for victims and survivors. Um, my understanding is that victims and survivors are absolutely included in Peace Plus and that the process would be similar um, to Peace 4, where VSS is named as the lead partner and it would be a closed call to VSS. We would prepare the application, receive the funding, and then we would distribute it to the community of voluntary organisations. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm aware that the time frame was tight and so with the gaps we were concerned about, but it's good to know that uh, that, that work is unfolding. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Next, um, Trevor Clark, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? No, I think those things are covered, thanks. Okay, and George Robinson, any questions you'd like to ask? Chair, I, I'm the same. I'm, I've been listening very intently, and uh, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it. I'll just keep, I'll just keep listening. <laughs> no, that's okay. I appreciate that you are near the end. Sometimes all the, the it, questions it, have already been asked. Very, very informative, and uh, I'd like to thank the, the three speakers there. Uh, okay. They're very, very constructive, and uh, I'll keep listening. Okay, thank you, George. And just to check if um, Emma is online, because I know there was some noises of people coming in and out there. Emma, are you online at the minute? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I just checked out. the signal when you live in the mountains. These <laughs> some that you have to do with the time. But no, I'm here. I'm, I'm listening. I don't have any questions at the minute. Okay, that's great, Emma. You're very welcome. Thank you for, for coming on board there. Um, well, look, Margaret, Oliver and Andrew, thank you very much for your contribution today. Um, I mean, the whole coronavirus um, ha has sort of uh, punctuated what we were trying to do at the beginning of this committee by, by bringing people on board at the beginning just to get a flavour of the work that's happening out within the various sectors and various parts of the executive office responsibilities. So um, it's absolutely no slight that it's taken us to May uh, to, to bring yourselves along. We've taken a gap there of about six or seven weeks whilst other issues have taken over but can I take the opportunity to thank you for coming on board and giving us the information and to wish you all the very best with your work especially uh, in the difficult circumstances and in the new ways that our people have are, are having to work at this and we look forward to interacting with you again in the future. Thank you very much for the invitation to appear before you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you to the committee. Thank you. Thank you now. Well, well folks, we'll just give 30 seconds to let people... Thank you. Disembarked from the call. As I was updating others earlier, this will be the penultimate week of teleconferencing. We'll hopefully move on to a different system in two weeks' time, which will make life a bit a bit easier. Um, okay, uh, members. Then uh, we can move on then to item five, um, which uh, is regarding the census order, the draft statutory rule. Uh, just to remind everybody that we did consider the draft rule at our meeting on the 22nd of April and we did say that subject to the examiner's statutory rules report recommended that it should be approved by the Assembly. So update members that the examiner's statutory rules reported in the draft rule on the 1st of May and there were no issues raised. A copy of the report can be found on page 24 of the meeting papers. Um, so therefore the draft census order was also approved by the Assembly yesterday. So if I could ask for members' agreement that we complete the, com the committee's scrutiny of the draft rule and ask you to note that the examiner had no issues to raise and the draft statutory rule was approved by the Assembly on Tuesday the 5th of May 2020. All content with that? Yes, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're on to forward work programme, uh, which is on page 51 of the pack. Just to update for members that um, the Equality Commission will be along to brief the committee through teleconferencing at next week's meeting. Uh, the Community Relations Council is scheduled to brief the week after. And also, uh, I'll make some reference under Chairman's remarks to a meeting that was held earlier in the week, but the junior ministers will brief the committee next week on the first ever withdrawal agreement joint committee meeting, which took place on the 30th of March. Um, and the joint UK-EU committee, which oversees the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Um, so it's made up of the politicians and the junior ministers attended that. So they're going to come along next week and give us uh, an update on that meeting. Um, members happy enough to note the forward work plan? Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, um, then item seven is correspondence. Just to advise members that a number of pieces of correspondence on historical institutional abuse have been received but have not been included in the committee packs. Um, the reason being that one piece of the correspondence has made reference to legal action having begun. Now, the subjudice rule is in Standing Order 73, and it provides that, where, that matters where legal proceedings are active should not be referred to in committee proceedings, ex except to the extent permitted by the chairperson, which is, in other words, me updating people where we are. So, look, until it can be established whether legal proceedings are active, it would not be appropriate for the committee to consider this correspondence. Uh, I can let member know that those... Uh, who sent the correspondence will be advised that this is the case. Now, given that the Executive Office would be the respondent to any proceedings, if I could seek agreement to write to the Department to request the factual background to the matter, including whether there are proceedings or not. Now, whether proceedings are active for the purposes of the Contempt of Court Act 1981 is a legal question, and then legal services uh, with that when the f factual background is provided. I'll maybe say that again for I didn't understand it myself reading it. Just <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all where you pause in the sentence. So whether proceedings are active for the purposes of the Contempt of Court Act 1981 is a legal question, and legal services can assist with that when the factual background is provided. Um, so members may uh, note that the, the uh, committee meeting papers are provided to allow members to carry out their scrutiny role. So having received the information, members become information owners so if anything is contained within the papers and assured it could be a breaching of information so it's really just we need to determine is there legal proceedings and if there are then that impacts what we can and cannot do so with members agreement we will seek that, that information is that agreed yes, okay okay um there are four items of correspondence at page 55 of the meeting pack. Um, so just to bring your, a few to your attention, item 7.1, which is at page 56 of the meeting pack, is a response from the department on the concerns raised by members that neither the assembly nor the committee had an opportunity to consider the health protection regulations before they came into operation. Um, if you're content to note, um, but also... Uh, under Chairman's remarks, I'll give you some more because I'll update on the conversation that I had with the First and Deputy First Minister regarding that issue. Um, and item 7.4 on page 67 is correspondence from the Committee of Finance uh, regarding the function of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Um, so a draft timetable for our committee's consideration of the bill will be considered at next week's meeting. So are members happy enough to note that and the other items in the list? Yep. Okay, um, then item eight is chairman's business. So just to update that on. Uh, Chair, I'm, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Can I just turn to page fifty-nine in their pack? I know you sort of dispatched with this business, but I, I'm looking at the figures there. That's yeah. astonishing. Like eleven people. In the, right, for a start, there are 47 EIS press officers. 11 of them are on a grade 48, 829 to 53, 518. 28 are between 37 and 40, and 8 are between 30 and 32. I would like to find out what the equivalent figures are for the Government of Wales and the Government of Scotland, maybe the Government of the Isle of Man, because to my mind, I mean, a, a quick calculation, what's that? Uh, 11 on that top one, that's half a million pounds. Right, so. That's half a million pounds. Uh, 30 on that other one, that's 1.2 million pounds. And 8 on the last 240,000 pounds. That's, what, that's, a, that's not a kick in the backside of 2 million pounds a year. On press officers. I really do think that we should do some a piece of research on that to see what the equivalent levels are in governments elsewhere. Okay, so um, there they are quite astonishing figures. Um, 
also astonishing was your impressive mod, sir. So I think that uh, <laughs> the number on that on the hop as well. Um, maybe if I look at the clerk, is that a piece of research that we could request from the research services? I mean, something just research just service here if you want to request um, just a comparator. Uh, yeah, comparator figures for Wales, Scotland, and Isle of Man. Yeah. Well, uh, England, the, the, all of the... Uh, just all of them. All, all of the, re the yeah. involved regions okay. of that. Okay. And even, like, I can't imagine that the, the London Mayor's Office, or the London Assembly, which governs a population, what, five times ours, would have that many press officers. Okay. Okay, members agreed then, just to get that piece of research? Okay. Maybe. Um... So then, an item eight then in chairman's business. Um, just to say, there was to update members that on Monday we had, uh, or he had a meeting um, with the uh, first and deputy first minister and the junior ministers, um, in a, and in, in the conversation we discussed um, some of the issues that have been highlighted about the lack of information that was coming from the department to ourselves. And I have to say that the the, the meeting was very. Um, very agreeable and that there was recognition that a lot of information hadn't made its way uh, to ourselves in so far as updating us as to what was happening and there was a recognition that that, that shouldn't be the case and there was a, a commitment um, to uh, try and address that. Some of the issues that we discussed were issues of communication. Uh, such as getting letters to update us about things that were actually happening within the department um, and also about attendance at the uh, committee here in itself. And there was in the meeting commitment that we would have the junior ministers um, next week. Uh, and then we hope to have a first and deputy first minister back the week after to look at the uh, overall management and issues relating to the COVID um, response from the department. And also there was um, agreement, as I say, that there should be a better information flowing back and forward to ourselves. In terms of the Brexit subcommittee, we do just need to clarify a small issue, which is that as a subcommittee, we were the, we were the committee to scrutinise the subcommittee, but the subcommittee has been subsumed into the, as an agenda item on the executive. But we just need to sort out clarify because the meetings of the executive are in private, um, and therefore we just need to know how can we scrutinise work that's been taking place and meetings are private. But I, I hope that the purpose for putting that back into the executive was because the executive was meeting three times a week to deal with COVID. So there was a sense that it didn't need to meet a fourth time in the week to deal with Brexit and therefore it could be dealt with. So we, we, we'll get some information on that. Um, there was some response given about the COVID-19 uh, work that has been taken by the department, but uh, they've also said that the First and Deputy First Minister, I think, are uh, probably going to go to the COVID ad hoc committee in the Assembly either this week or next week, and then they will come to us is it next Tuesday? I think was I think tomorrow is Diane and Naomi. Naomi Long. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's probably Tuesday. The business committee thought it was, it was going to be Friday or Tuesday, but Friday's Tuesday would be a plenary session, so it would maybe next Thursday. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only thing that's on the plenary, is the. Oh right. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. <laughs> that's that's, yeah. that's so. Uh, but anyway, that 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 will be that they will come to ourselves then the week after the, to allow us to have a conversation. Um, and we also discussed the historical institutional abuse issues and issues about the language bills, which we know was something that was going to uh, inform the uh, forward work plan of the committee. So we've just asked for some information on that. So maybe with members' agreement, we'll just write to the um, department on those issues just to seek that clarification in written form for people. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well then, members with agreement, we'll move to item number nine, which is any other business. Does members have any member have any other business? No. Just to put on the record, I think it would only be fair because he's been on. He was on this committee a long, long time. Just to put on the record, appreciation for the contribution that Mike made to this. Committee. Certainly, um, we made some reference at the start, but uh, yeah, I think we could. We certainly could have made greater. Um, uh, maybe leave it there, but I think it's. It's only fair to say so. It was a long time on the committee previous, uh, and it's former utterance as well. Yeah. So, yeah. He, he's just off the uh, committee. He's not out of the assembly, is he? No. No. no, 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 no. Okay, um, folks. The date, time, place of next meeting will be here in this room next week at two o'clock, Wednesday, the thirteenth of May. Uh, if members are happy, we'll conclude the meeting there. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you.
committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.